So here's another opportunity to see this unique vehicle in the Swedish Museum. Uh, this is the Sturmgeschutz uh, Ausfrung D, which is a 7.5 centimeter L24 cannon. Um, and what's particularly interesting is that this is the only one that's readily available to people in Europe. Uh, this vehicle would have been manufactured about 1941 and uh, it then was in service uh, with the German uh, Sturm artillery for a period of time. But what we can see on the vehicle is lots of interesting things that show that it came back for uh, extensive repair and refurbishment. Uh, for example, there's original Zimmerit, uh, which is the anti-magnetic mine uh, paste, which prevents magnetic devices sticking on the vehicle. This has been coated onto the vehicle. That could only have happened in 1943 onwards uh, for a period of about a year up till September 45. And that shows that this vehicle came back and was modernized to what was then current standards. Uh, a second thing that's of interest is that the uh, original configuration of the engine didn't have the centrifugal air cleaning system. So it dust was collected and entered the engine compartment and wore out the engines quickly. So uh, a solution to this problem was to introduce these uh, Filzbag uh, pre-filters that cleaned the air before it went into, this, into the air uh, system. And this was particularly an issue with vehicles when they were given the Schurzen armour plates on the side. Now, People will, uh, who are studying these things will know that uh, Sturmgeschütz in 1941 certainly never had Schurzen, but we can see because of this vehicle's extensive rebuilding and repair, we can see the mounting points for the brackets for the Schurzen, and there are bolt holes here for the hangers where the Schurzen were put on. So this vehicle was brought up to modern standards, except for the, it retained its perfectly good working gun. Uh, so it's pretty unique in that sense. It's also unique in that there is none, none of the short barrel Sturmgeschütz available to see in any easy to find location. This has the correct set of the uh, height of the, sh the hull where there's, uh, there's one has been partially restored, which is over height. Um, and many other features on this is absolutely original. This vehicle hit a mine at some stage and this damaged all this area here, so this part is uh, a, a short-term repair that was done, but all of this is original. The original concept of uh, Sturmgeschütz was that it was meant to be able to assault uh, fortified positions like bunkers or um, infantry um, for, uh, fortifications. And it had, compared to the Panzer III chassis on which it's based, it has 50 millimetre of armour on the front right from the beginning, the 50 millimetre here. But by 1943, that was changed and an extra 30 millimetre plate was added on, 30 millimetres bolted on and a long uh, 75 uh, Sturmgeschütz cannon uh, in place and then it was the, the production of these was divided between the Panzer troops and the Sturm artillery. The uh, Panzer troops ca had a vehicle that's different to the uh, Sturm artillery because, and, but the only feature that you know uh, that it is different is the radio systems are totally different between the two uh, areas of the force. The Panzer troops used it as an anti-tank gun weapon and it's probably the most uh, um, successful of the German vehicles throughout the war in terms of the number of other vehicles it knocked out. So is there anything that we, we could say or at least assume about where this vehicle could have served since it was built in the 1941, summer, the summer of, yeah. of 1941, yeah. and it was in use until the end of the war. And we know that it was, it came from Denmark, where where it finally ended up. With, yes. But where would you say that it probably was used from belt until it went back to Denmark? Well, it certainly never went to North Africa. Um, uh, people sometimes assume that these uh, Filzbag uh, 
pre-filters are a sign of North Africa, um, but that's not the case. The, the, these were introduced really in 1943. You see them a lot on uh, both Sturmgeschütz and on Panzer IVs, and they, they were really an attempt to um, overcome this problem. The inside, when the uh, Schurzen plates were in place, the dust thrown up couldn't go out, it had to come in, and more went, was ingested by the engine and caused the damage. Um, towards the latter part of 43, uh, they had invented a new type of air cleaner, which was a centrifugal air cleaner, which meant that they didn't need these pre-filters. But the pre-filter has nothing to do with North Africa, although the six of these vehicles went to North Africa and they had an early version of that pre-cleaner on them. But this one certainly never went to North Africa. So on, on balance, without specific information, one would say it probably served in somewhere on the Russian front. Um, and uh, then having worn out, because there's no evidence of any serious uh, impact damage, uh, so I would say it's most likely it just wore out and had to come back for a refurbishing, and then the, the various changes and improvements were put into place, and then it, because it still had its short barrel gun, it was dispatched from the Herozoigamt to a secondary theatre where uh, they didn't need the latest in terms of anti-tank gun performance. And so so it, it probably then went to to Russian front from the beginning and then went back. And yeah, but may, maybe it didn't go back to to Germany uh, to uh, to Denmark directly. It could have been somewhere else before it ended up in in Denmark. Yes, I mean it could have been down in Greece or somewhere in the Balkans uh, or in Italy or somewhere like that. But but most likely, I think it would be uh, would be have been servicing serviced in the Eastern Front. Yeah, yeah. Um, and these short bell, bell guns, um, uh, as I understand, they, they were pretty much liked by, by the, the, the crews, but it's a, it's a short and, and compared to a big, a big gun, it would have been something that you really liked, but they still continue to use them. And Yes, the, the, the short barreled uh, L24 uh, KWK was used right up to the end of the war were still being manufactured and they were being used uh, as a, the armament on uh, 251 half tracks to provide uh, support for infantry grenadiers and they were used in fortress uh, locations and generally they were liked because they had a, uh, a relatively small ammunition so they could be loaded rather quickly so you could keep up a very high rate of fire they have a good performance in terms of high explosive and they had an anti-tank gun an anti-tank capability uh, as well so they were they were definitely of, of interest now so I suppose if you look at the vehicle, it could have been upgunned quite easily to a, to a, a long gun. Mm. That's, uh, that's feasible just by removing the uh, gun. And we see on photographs some examples of, the, of them where they have been upgunned to the long gun. But obviously this one was perfectly working and was perfectly good in, in Denmark. Um, and these, these were made parallel with the Panzer III. Yes, well, the, the Panzer III went into production first, but almost simultaneously the, this uh, chassis came along. The, the actually chassis, chassis, chassis components are identical to a Panzer III, but as I said, this has a heavier armour, especially at the front, uh, to protect it against uh, incoming fire at the time. So 50 millimetres, which was... Uh, unknown really at, in 1939 when this thing was about to enter service. So it was well protected. When, when they realized they needed extra armor, they bolted 30 millimeter plates onto the front and to give it that extra protection. And then eventually in 1943, they went over to 80 millimeter basic armor for the front of these, but the chassis continued on exactly the same and it's a single torsion bar uh, suspension like the Panzer III. So here we are standing in front um, 
of a vehicle that, uh, in fact, is original, uh, yes. made during the war and uh, not the uh, post-war G13. But uh, there are a lot of details and components and also the story behind this that is quite interesting. Yes. So, what's your opinion? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the origin of this particular vehicle was... Uh, Following the bombing of Alket in Berlin in 1943, they were desperately looking for alternative production for uh, facilities for Sturmgeschütz. But when they looked at the facilities in uh, BMM in Prague, the factory was not capable of producing Sturmgeschütz because it didn't have the right size uh, buildings, cranes and all the, all the things that go with it. So a new design was uh, initiated and very quickly they came up with this design here which is based on the Jagdpanzer IV which was in effect the new version of the Sturmgeschütz where the gun mantlet was like this, a ball mounting, a Pac-39 anti-tank gun. Um, but they wanted now to put this into a 38T chassis or to use as many of the existing well tried and tested components of a 38T. So although it looks like a 38T, it definitely is not a real 38T. The, dry, the a gearbox, the transmission, the engine, that's all coming straight from the 38T family. But even when we look at the, the wheels here, this suspension has been strengthened and increased in size quite dramatically. And what you can see here in, in the Swedish Museum is the interim between the uh, 38T wheels and the final uh, version of the Jagdpanzer 38 wheels. So. The row of bolts here and this wide rim, this is applying to the original discs of the 38T, this extra wide rim to make the, the, the tire much larger and give a longer wheelbase and a better support for the heavy gun that goes in. This is really designed as a well-armoured anti-tank gun. It only has 20 millimeter on the side, but compare that to the Marder that we looked at earlier on, where you have a very thin side armor. The crew are much better protected. And the front here is a 60 millimeter uh, plate, which in comparison to what was on the uh, self-propelled gun, like a Marder, is tremendous. But this is not as expensive and uh, high quality armor as you've got normally with the tanks or the Sturmgeschütz. Um, but they could be produced in fairly significant numbers and were obviously quite uh, um, appreciated by the troops that were then using them as uh, self-propelled anti-tank guns. The, the name Hetzer, which has become synonymous with this, is actually uh, nowhere to be found in official documentation. Uh, it appears to be a nickname that some of the, some of the troops use because at a conference uh, in November of 44, Guderian was asked to come back and report as to where these strange names were coming from. And to come back to who? To Hitler, okay. saying, where is this coming from? And some of the names he could justify because they were coming from industry or uh, ministries, but in the case of the Jagdpanzer 38, there was no explanation except some troops were using that name. Where they got it, nobody seems to know. So the correct name is Jagdpanzer 38. Uh, I think nowadays uh, there's a lot of confusion with the Swiss G13, because after the war, Skoda, who had joined the production uh, of these Jagdpanzer 38s, still had a tremendous number of components. And by components, I mean armoured bodies that had been manufactured either by themselves or by another party were sitting in their yard. And many of the, uh, the mechanical and uh, components were still available. And the Swiss were looking for a, a possible source of supply for equipment. Um, and Eventually, Skoda wrote a contract with the Swiss to supply these on, under their uh, code name of G13. But there are some fairly significant differences between a Jagdpanzer 38 and a G13. The most important 
is actually that the gun on a G13 is actually a, um, a STUK 40, which is the gun from the Sturmgeschütz, because Skoda was the largest manufacturer of those guns, so they had the capability of remanufacturing uh, the Stuk 40s, whereas this gun in the German Jagdpanzer 38 is a um, Pack. 39, which was only manufactured by a German company which had gone out of business. Okay. So in 1947, they, they were involved in the sales campaign and they were then supplied over 160 of these vehicles to Switzerland from the late 40s through into the early 50s. And you'll see there's a change in the wheels on a G13. The, the Sturmgeschütz gun is in there, which is completely different. The traverse mechanism, all of the mechanicals associated with the gun are quite different. But lots of people have got them. They take a quick look at the nice black and white photographs from the, the war period, and they look at the vehicle. It looks like uh, the same thing, and they then paint crosses and so forth. But if you want to see a genuine one, come here and have a look at it. The other thing that's very unusual. There's only one more that I know of in the world, and that's this heavy gun mantlet, which was the first gun mantlet that was introduced on the earlier versions of these. Um, later on, they made a, a slightly less complex and less heavy one, because all the time they were trying to reduce the, the, the weight on the, on the front wheels here. But it was a very effective gun when it was handed out to the uh, Panzerjäger people who were the anti-tank troops. They were very happy with it. So then this, since it looks very much like the 38, uh, it's a bit wider, it's a bit longer, and it's a bit higher. Bigger diameter wheels. Yes. Everything is, is getting bigger and bigger because they had to do that to carry the big gun uh, effectively. If you just had a 38 chassis, well, yes, you could put an anti-tank gun on top of it, but you couldn't encase it in a decent protection. So that is quite interesting to, to when you look at pictures from, from the wartime and you don't see the diameter and it's impossible to, to compare. Yeah. You need to, since when we did this one, we managed to, to find, well, that looks a bit strange. So I actually measured and there are different sizes yes. and I measured more and more and more and realized it's not the same chassis. Yep. It differs. Well, it's interesting also on the on the Jagdpanzer 38, they have uh, inclined armor for the side of the hull. Yes. Um, and here in the museum, we can compare this to the Landsberg M38 tanks. That's what they had as well. So it wasn't a brand new feature. It was, it was something that had already been tried out. Um, one thing that I've seen and, and people asking about is the limited visibility from, from this vehicle. Well, what can you say about that? It's an anti-tank gun. Yeah, but you need to, to, look, <laughs> to look out uh, anyway. It's not, it's not meant to be charging around like a tank, with, which needs lots of good visibility to see what's around. The, the concept of using these was that they, the uh, company commander should make sure the reconnaissance is done, that the area it's going to be involved in defending is well uh, assessed. And then these basically wait and lie in wait for something to come to them rather than the other way around. So you can depend on a little bit less vis visibility. Having said that, certainly in uh, BMM, towards the end of the war, they were experimenting with uh, different uh, and improved visibility. On, on the commander was due to get a rotating periscope um, on his compartment, which would have certainly been better than a straight ahead periscope. Mm -hmm. um, as we can see on, on this vehicle, the, the front headlight is wrong. It should be an Nautic light there. Yes. So that, that's done in, in, in Sweden. And also the periscope up there on the roof, it's not original. Uh, in that hole should be something else. Oh and, yes, that's and, and we, the, we're not sure why they put this periscope in there in the former uh, tank museum, but they did. So what should be in that hole? Well, I mean, that's, that's a uh, periscope from a Swedish uh, 
LT38 yes, in effect. So that's the same as you would get on normal M LT38. It, it could be that when they looked at whatever was remaining of this, that this is, there was actually a periscope in there, but this was the periscope that came up and was inside the remote control machine gun. And the remote control machine gun with its two shields around it was sitting there and uh, you, you placed a magazine for 50 rounds on top and you could fire that from completely operating like a periscope on a submarine for an inside. So you had a gun sight with a, uh, from a periscopic point of view underneath that. So it may be that that's why they chose to put something like that in there. But it would be nice to have the uh, remote control machine gun back in, but it's a very complex uh, device. I don't know that there's any of them around anymore. From, from the beginning when, when the vehicle came to Sweden in 1945 we have seen pictures of it and it had this bracket on top there but yes. I guess that that was probably in the way for the, the use of the vehicle so they just throw it off Yeah. Uh, so it disappeared but it's interesting with this kind of remote controlled machine gun application done in 1944 the same idea where you have on almost any vehicle today, they have a remote controlled gun mount on top of the vehicle instead of keeping the head out and, and exposing yourself. Yeah, well, the, the, the remote control machine gun was mounted there, but it was al already initiated on the Sturmgeschütz first and then modified to go on this one. So the two kind of then went hand in hand and it did give them a, uh, an ability to protect themselves from inside the vehicle uh, without having to get out and mm. uh, get involved in a hand Things fight. get back again 50, 60 years later, but in a different yeah. configuration. Uh, the visibility of, of this particular vehicle was pretty poor when they used it in, in Sweden. So they cut a hole um, at the front for the, the driver to be have a better, yes, better yes. view, but that has been welded shut. So we're, there's a, a thin plate uh, in there to, to make it look correct. Well, for, for people that are interested in the vehicles from a modeling point of view or anything else, the other thing that's interesting then is that this still has the, the um, cast cover for the periscope, whereas the, the Alponsa 38, say in Bovington, or in uh, the in the American uh, museums, that has a, a different arrangement where just the periscopes stick out through holes in the plate, and they just have a rain cover over them. But this is a protected. Uh, so that's uh, another evidence of that. This is a quite early. Oh, it's an earlier early vehicle, production yes, and yes, one of yes. the first ever made. Yeah, yeah. They, they, I mean there is. You can see that damage has occurred because here um, new towing no, uh, eyes have been added to the front because the, the original ones have been snapped off and that was a common problem with these earlier ones. It was later that they, they modified them uh, and put in this strengthening and so forth because it's relatively soft plate and if, um, if somebody tries to tow the vehicle slightly crooked or they jerk it suddenly, the plate will snap. Mm. And that, that they, they knew when they built the G13, they, they already had that strength. And That's right, they've already got, well, they've got two strengthening plates. They've, one is this, the horizontal uh, strengthening across, but they also have an extra side plate on to make sure that it doesn't crack. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the, the, all along, they were hoping that this Jagdpanzer 38 would be able to be fitted with a rigid mounted gun. So the German designation for that was a STAR, uh, S-T-A or R, a rigid mounted gun. So instead of the gun recoiling, you, it was locked in position and the vehicle suspension would absorb the recoil. Oh, okay. yeah. um, the advantage of that is you, you save a huge amount of space in t internally. Um, now there was about 10 of these built in the end, they were tested for a long period of time, but originally they were hoping that they would go into production with that, but they never really did. There was just a few uh, that you were used, and they were used, you could say, in action when the Czechs took over after the German uh, surrender. 
in, in, in many, many of the museums and collections all over, over the world, when, when I look at pictures and, and films, I can identify a few things that actually tells this is not an original, it's a G13. Yeah. And we have a sort of a small club on Facebook chasing who can trace the fake, <laughs> the fake ones. Uh, but it's interesting to, to, to look in, and on many of these guns on those Hetzers, yeah. there is a thread at, at the end of the barrel. Yes. Uh, and that has that is something that you, you see on these vehicles, but there should be a muscle brake sitting there. Yes. So that is the evidence for that. It's not the original. Well, this, again, this, one this has kind to remember. of of of, uh, of gun. So they have undone the the muscle brake. One has to remember that the Swiss vehicles always have a Sturm Cannon 40. It's a different gun, yes. completely different recoil system, and that was one of the features, obviously, of a Sturmgeschütz gun was to have the muzzle brake on it. But for this, they all, right from the beginning, they were intending not to bother with the uh, the muzzle brake. They were using part of the vehicle to absorb the the recoil. So, in in case of of disguising a G13 to look more like a head. So there are certain things that you have to do to look it, yeah, ma make it look a bit more uh, original. There's n the, the, the exterior has only got a few small things on it that give it away. The big giveaway is you open the hatch, you look in and straight away you see there's no traverse like in a German vehicle. It's, it's a totally different mechanism that they had to introduce for the uh, Stug K40. Um, interesting vehicle. Mm, absolutely. Good.